let's just have a look at our schedule. Just like usual, I'll drop a link into the chat if anybody likes to migrate to the web page. So um, last week we finished our long stint on the boot camp, and um, I was pretty pleased with the the turnout for that, and I hope everybody got something from that. It took us about, um, well, 12 weeks of stuff, but I think it took us about 16 weeks, given a few weeks off. And today, by request, we're going to talk about the Git and GitHub, these tools that um, in my workflow I use every day. Uh, virtually every day, I, I use it indirectly for sure every day, and I use them directly every other day or may, maybe every day some weeks. So uh, we'll talk about what they are. You've probably heard about them. Um, talk about some of the reasons why you might use them and so forth. I've got some slides set up if you like to follow along with them. I look ahead to future meetings. I was only hypothetically um, threatening Anna with uh, an invitation to come and do something because I will be looking for a topic and we don't have a topic for next week. Um, now, if we don't have a topic for next week and nobody volunteers or I can't think of anything, what I may suggest doing for next week is um, I've, I've been involved in um, using an AI foundation model for analyzing bird songs. And I'm, I'm in the middle of a few things just at the early stages of this project. And there is a master student who I uh, don't see in the chat today, but uh, she may she may come a little bit later on and sometimes does come, who's doing some of this for her master's project. And I think I may talk about that and demonstrate the code that's in Python and um, haven't done any statistics on the data, the sample data I've collected, but it, it uses an AI model to um, analyze bird sound recordings and identify species. And the idea for this is that it, can automate the capture of biodiversity data. For example, if there's some on-farm um, intervention, like we have some skylark plots and some strips on the boundaries of uh, fields, the idea is for those um, to be part of a compensation scheme for farmers as a way to mitigate impacts on biodiversity. But there needs to be evidence for that. And getting that evidence is really hard because you have to be an expert in collecting biodiversity data. You have to know a lot about birds or or uh, insects or uh, other organisms. And it's time consuming and very expensive. So what AI promises to do and um, devices that incorporate AI promises to do is to make that more efficient. So maybe I'll maybe I'll talk about that next week. And the weekend after that, um, it's our 150th meeting for the R group. And I think um, what we'll plan to do is maybe um, have a hybrid meeting where we meet in person, maybe work on something fun. Maybe uh, something we've done in the past on that day is we've, uh, in fact, we're going to talk about Git and GitHub today. Um, at, at one past meeting, I think for the 100th meeting, we made uh, personal websites um, using Git and Markdown and GitHub. It's a free way to have a personalized website to show off um, yeah, your CV or any other things that you want. So maybe we'll do something like that. If anybody has any ideas, though, the reason I mention that is uh, please let me know if you have any ideas or if you'd like to volunteer for one of these meetings. I can do my bird net thing anytime. Okay. So uh, if you want to follow along with the slides, you can just click on them. I've already opened them up. And they're right here. OK, so um, I think I originally titled this um, Git and GitHub for Interesting People, but I've, I've retitled it for everyone. This is just an introduction for people who probably haven't used Git, maybe don't understand what, why you would use it or how to use it. So I'll cover each of those things today. Um, the interesting people part was not just me trying to be funny, though. Um, one of the things I don't have in these slides, I'll try to remember to elaborate on this as we come across it, 
is that um, these tools that I'm about to tell you about have um, been invented. They've been in wide use now, I'd say for, oh, 10, 15 years. I think uh, over that period of time, they've become a, a real staple for people who work with um, with any kind of code. But they were they actually invented for people who were developing software. And um, I mean, computer programmers and um, software engineers. And uh, a lot of times those projects, um, 15 years ago, let's say, they, they could be quite complex. They could involve, for a, even a medium-sized project, they could involve hundreds of files. And for some pieces of software, or let's just call them projects. It doesn't have to be, as I'll, as I'll explain to you, we don't um, have to restrict these tools to, uh, to software development. In fact, um, I don't use it at all for that kind of thing. I use it only for data analysis almost exclusively. Um, but back in the day when it was invented for software developers, um, even for small and medium projects where you would have all these files, it would be very common have multiple people working on the same code base, or if it's a medium or large data analysis project, on the combination of uh, data analysis files, data files, and outputs from those files like reports, reports that get updated, um, to keep track of them so that multiple key people could edit them. And it um, there's a systematic way so that mistakes aren't made and that someone is in control and you can track the base. And critically, one of the big use cases for um, Git and GitHub these days, for me, I'll just say it here in the beginning and then we'll walk through some jargon and some examples, is um, that in, in case you make a mistake, you have a way to ro reel back the edits that have been made to a previous time point before the mistake was made. And now if it's just one person, you can make mistakes. I certainly have. Uh, and I, I have used Git to roll back to previous versions where I've made an error. But when you have multiple people working on something, the probability that something happens by mistake is amplified. So that's one reason. And, and another reason is that it's a free way to back up your data um, in the cloud. And then a, a final big reason for me, probably the biggest reason that I use Git um, a lot, is that it gives me the opportunity for um, collaboration. I can share code and show my code to other people. I'll try to make time and leave time to demonstrate that just a little bit today. Okay. So, um, so what is Git? Now, I've said um, in the title, Git, and a, as a distinct thing, I've said GitHub, and I'm going to treat those separately. So I'm going to start with the idea of just what Git is. And uh, Git is a piece of software, and it was made um, quite a long time ago now. I, I think quite a lot longer than 10 or 15 years ago, but it, I first became aware of it about then, and it's been in wide use and increasing popularity since then. And it, and it's referred to as version control software. It's open source. Uh, because it's open source, there are many versions of Git, many flavors of Git, if you will, and there are alternatives to Git. But to my knowledge, um, the the classic vanilla Git is the most popular and the most widespread version control software there is. Companies, um, before Git came in, companies had already had this idea and many companies had developed their own um, internal system for maintaining the integrity of, um, of code. And the first time I encountered version control was um, when I was a graduate student myself. And I began working on a statistics project, a data analysis code base with, with a lot of other people. And I only had some little jobs to do in it myself. And I became aware that they were using this 
um, this professional version control system that <clears throat> you had to log into, you had to put up a flag when you were going to edit a file and then check it out a little bit later. So um, old older kinds of heavy handed software like that gave rise to this very elegant, it's thought of as a very elegant tool to uh, to do version control for lots of um, files and projects. And uh, the main function is to track changes. So if you make, uh, if you have 100 files and you only change um, one line in one file, what Git does is it actually records the difference and uh, the kind of jargon term for a difference between two file versions is a diff. Um, what Git does is it actually tracks the diff between versions of uh, the entire snapshot of a, of a project. And it, it does it for every file separately. And um, it all also does it comprehensively for every single change that is ever made from the beginning of time when you start tracking changes with Git to to the end of time when there are no more changes to be made. OK, so that, that's really all that it does. That's really all that it does. Very simple. <clears throat> Why should you care about it? Why should you care about Git? Well, the um, the interesting people part of my um, proposed topic here had to do with the uh, applied scientists like like everyone that's here. Um, the reason applied scientists have more and more begun using Git is because um, it turns out that Git is really good for reproducible practice. I can't remember how much we've talked about reproducible practice over the uh, the weeks and longer, but um, it's essentially the um, the practice of of curating any analysis, any data that you collect in a uh, in a form so that any outputs that arise from it, any any um, statistical analyses, any graphs, that they can be reproduced explicitly with the exact endpoint from um, from a from a code base. If you're using R, um, the R script and the data file would allow you to reproduce almost everything. Uh, so Git is really good for reproducible practice. Uh, I don't know of any journals these days that um, mandate that you that you have um, code along with your manuscript with reproducible um, data analysis instructions. But uh, I've certainly seen more and more papers where code is is uh, given in the um, in the appendix or in the supplementary materials. So it's becoming more and more common. And the easiest way to do that would be a link to a Git repository. Uh, another thing is that I already mentioned is that using Git prevents accidental mistakes. <laughs> the commonest thing that I see um, people do, I did it as a matter of fact long ago when I um, began as well, is um, is editing, editing data is one of the real big ones. Um, one way to get around that is you make many, many versions of your data sets. Um, Maybe you accidentally delete something, or maybe you save over something. Maybe your computer um, makes you lose work. All of those are accidents. Or, or maybe you, in the passive aggressive Butler of R, um, you write some code that, that is wrong, but it actually executes, and there's a mistake in there. Um, essentially, like I explained, Git allows you to roll back any mistakes to a previous time before a mistake was made in case something's accidentally corrupted or deleted. But the big one is collaboration with other people. If um, I'm looking at a few people in the in the chat that I, I have used Git with, um, I use it extensively if, if there's a project. If it's any more complicated than then uh, one data set and one R script, I will tend these days um, in my in my 
current practice to uh, to make a Git repository. Um, now, I want to explain how it's used, and I have a number of slides to explain in very simple terms um, just the idea of using Git and then how you can use it for your own work, even if you're just curious. You can use it for your analysis, but as I mentioned, um, you can use it to make a web page. As a matter of fact, our, our um, users group web page is a GitHub repository um, that is written entirely 100% with our with our code. It's using modern. The latest version uses Quarto within R. So I'll I'll kind of talk through all of that stuff and sh and show you some stuff um, at the end. <clears throat> So uh, let's let's walk through Git and talk about um, just how it works. So uh, let's say that you have a directory, a folder on your computer, and it's your working directory for some project. And let's say that you um, the Git software you have to um, you have to notify it that a directory you're working in is meant to be a, uh, a a git watched space so we'll talk about how to do that in a little bit but forget about that now just pretend you have a a working directory that is a git space and let's say you've got some data data file let's say you've got an r script and um the idea of this is that when you when you alert git to this space in your in your computer that it it simply watches the status of this um, the contents of this directory and any change that happens, it, it just records it. It just keeps track of it. Um, it only records the diff. I'm, I haven't emphasized this in this um, in this talk, but um, I really I really wanted to just get the basics out there, and then we can carry on with this if people want to. But uh, one of the real interesting things, one of the elegant things about Git, is that um, it's very lightweight and very fast. So it only records the the differences, the diff. Um, so it's not it's not taking up tons of space or memory in any part of the system. So let's say that uh, in this working directory you're developing your your um, analysis here, and let's say that you you know you add some lines of um, of a new analysis in your R script. So so now this is a changed file. And let's say as part of that, also you output a graph file. So these have appeared um, in your working directory. So you've got one whole new file that has appeared, and you've got just a few lines of text that have been changed and added to uh, to your R script. Now these these changes, as I mentioned, are are tracked, and uh, now they're they're tracked. But you can also scrutinize these changes. Um, and you, you can decide whether or not, um, remember it's the case, this is a very general system for all kinds of projects from the very smallest to the very biggest. So it might seem a bit simplistic to you to have the chance that you, you know, the opportunity to evaluate a couple of lines you added to an R script. After all, you added them. That doesn't really make sense. But uh, we got to think of this in context of a bigger project. Maybe you added those lines several weeks ago and then you had some field or lab work and you're just coming back into it and you're like oh yeah you know i've made these changes you have the chance to review the changes that were made just the diff and uh and um kind of evaluate whether you want to keep them or not just as an example now all of this will happen because this is your working directory it would it would typically happen on your local computer. This works on any kind of computer, whether I said that yet or not, Windows, Macs, Linux, and it works on um, really old hardware up to the, the very brand new um, part of it. So this is the basics of how you would use Git just on your computer. What happens next <laughs> is, well, there's this idea of a repository. So a, a repo, it's kind of like a backup version of your of your working directory with all your files in it. And um, now often 
your your repo will live in the cloud somewhere. And um, there, there are many different providers of a service to have a, a Git repo in the cloud. I'll, t I'll tell you about the one that I use every day, probably the most popular one, and, and it's free and everything like that. Um, but that's separate to Git. Git is just the software here that uh, that watches for those differences. And um, so if your repository is in the cloud and you've made those changes locally, um, your repo up in the cloud will not reflect those changes. Not, not yet. Something has to happen before you do that. And, uh, you know, we we think about adding those changes or making those changes to update our repository and um, the the typical jargon for a repository is uh, is a repo. Okay, so that's doesn't have to be on the cloud either. In a company, um, you may or may not. I think um, some years ago it would have been unusual before the cloud dominated everything, but um, most companies would have a local server on their network and uh, you would have a, a version of your Git repo on that local server. And so uh, that this cloud part, would it could be a server on your local network if you were a company, but um, these days it would almost always be on the cloud. <clears throat> so I've already mentioned some uh, jargon like a repo, the idea of the repo, but there is a few, um, there are a few jargon concepts that um, I thought that we couldn't do without, even right here in the beginning. And uh, one of them, I'll demonstrate all of these in diagrams in a second, but one of them is the the pull. So um, not not only are these little jargon terms and, and tied to concepts to do with um, Git and GitHub, but there are, there are also commands that you can execute. So you do have to memorize few of these, at least the concepts. All right, so the poll, um, it gets the latest version of your of your repo um, from the cloud onto your local computer. Now, if it's just you working on it, um, you may already have the, the most up-to-date version. But if you work on different computers or if you collaborate with other people, then um, you know you're you're not you not necessarily do you have the uh, the latest version. So this is one of the the key concepts to uh, using Git the pull. Now once you've made those changes local, and you want to um, you want to add those changes and update your remote repository. Once you're sure that you have something you want to um, want to change, you would commit them. You would commit the changes, and that sort of makes a stopping point for the diff or the differences. And uh, it it's a formal statement of the intent to um, to commit those changes up to the cloud version of your repo, and then the push. Um, once you've committed your files and only once you've committed your your changes, um, you would then push them. And the idea is that you're pushing them up to the cloud. Um, so that saves the changes in your diff and uh, puts it in your in your repo. And another concept is, and th this is a, one of the ways I, I think it's probably the easiest way to start using GitHub for almost um, anybody who hasn't used it before, and that's the clone. So if there is a um, if there is a repository on GitHub, I, I mentioned GitHub, but I haven't told you what GitHub is as a separate thing from Git yet, so we'll come on to that in a moment. But if you find um, a, a repository on a on a website like GitHub, and you decide, hey, I'd like to tinker around with that, and uh, maybe I want to adapt their analysis to something I'm doing, or I really like their figure, I want to see how they do it, or it's anything like that. What you can do is just, uh, if it's a public repository, if it's if it's made open and public, 
which many, many repositories are, even many very popular ones are, are open. What you can do is you can copy that, that repo. You can copy it down to your computer. You can make a clone of it and make your own repository that you're going to continue to develop. Um, so that's when you would use the clone command, usually when you're using somebody else's repo. I use clone sometimes even on my own repositories. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a little while. Is uh, I might use it if if I want, let's say that most of my work is done on my local computer and I have a repo in my working directory that's watched and I have uh, the the repo living on a cloud site. <clears throat> but what if I want to what if I want to um, develop an analysis on my local computer, but the data are very big? What if I have a lot of data and it's maybe it's too much to run on my local computer, or maybe it would run slowly on my local computer because it's big? Well, I might want to I might want to perform that analysis um, on on a cloud computer, like say Google Colab or R Studio Cloud. Where I can um, where I can ask for resources that have a lot of RAM or a, a very fast processor. Well, what I can do is I can set up all of my all of my analysis on my local computer. Um, I can push that to my repo in the cloud. So that lives over here in in GitHub, let's say. And then I can come over over to a place like our studio cloud and uh, what i can say is right i want to clone i want to clone that repo into this other server so i move all of the material over to our studio cloud clone it in and then it can run the analysis it's very convenient to do that uh, you don't have to upload anything you don't have to um, worry about backing up anything uh, it's a very elegant way to save your data and use computing resources that you may not have on your desktop. Maybe it's a time for me to just say, I'm not going to talk about this very much today, but to say that um, Megan and I have talked about this recently, that um, there was a time when people who worked with, with large data sets um, a long time ago would have to really wait a long time to uh, even normal scientists, um, I'm, I guess I'm going back before before my career. Now there was a time in the past when even relatively small data sets, by modern standards, you had to use um, central computers. This is before most people had laptops and computers on their desk, and it took a long time. It would take weeks to run a regression analysis. You'd have to wait in a long queue and then run it, and then a day or two later, come back and get your results. If you made a little mistake, you'd have to do the whole thing over again. And then we all, in the subsequent decades, kind of got used to having computers on our desk um, and laptops and things like that. They're so convenient, so easy to use, and they got faster and faster and faster up to a point. And now data availability is so wide that um, and uh, the data sets we typically may use, may want to use, are so big that even if you have a pretty good computer, um, sometimes not enough. And so the use of cloud computers has become so easy and prevalent um, that we use them for big data. We have to use them for big data, but I've started using them for other things just because they're easier and this clone uh, is one of the the ways and one of the reasons that makes it so easy for me to use cloud computers and and for other interesting people too. So I just went through those concepts to define the jargon, but I I'm very visual as a learner myself, so I kind of made a few diagrams here. Um, to uh, to illustrate the point. So uh, let, let's say that you've got a local working directory um, and you want to uh, work on 
some code and, and data and an analysis on your local computer. Uh, let's say that this is already a, a Git repository locally, but let's just say for the sake of the argument that there are no files in it to start with. <clears throat> and then up in the cloud, there's a Git repository you want to work in, but you don't have the latest files. What you would do in this case is you would pull the uh, the latest files, the status of the latest snapshot down to your working directory. So then, then your local working directory would be identical to the cloud after that pull command. So that just that just is how pull works. Just updates everything to the latest diff relative to the cloud. Then let's say that you start working on these scripts and you add a little bit of code to the uh, R script and uh, the the white dash line indicates that there's been a change in that script. And the plus is just meant to remind us that it's maybe just a line or two or maybe more significant changes in the R script. And also you've added a graph file here. And uh, at that stage, um, you maybe you finished working and you want to update, you're, you're happy and you want to keep the changes you've made. Um, at that stage, then you want to do a commit to commit to those changes and make a stopping point that that Git um, will pay attention to. It will collate all of the changes that you've made in that diff and, and create a stopping point. This is a stopping point that you could go back to to restore um, at any point in time. Of course, for any project, you'll have many, many of these stopping points. Um, and at the same time as you commit, usually, at least in my workflow, I would merge. Uh, so once I commit some changes, I would just go ahead and merge them up to the cloud uh, right away. And, and that would add my, my diff to the cloud version of my repo and um, so that now they match again. Um, the difference between the previous slide, this one, is that um, I'm updating my local computer to the state of the cloud, you're the last computer. Um, <clears throat> here, I'm, I'm taking the changes that I've made, the additions I've made, and updating them to the cloud. So that's kind of the, um, the idea of those. Now let's unpack this picture. Put this picture in here to remind myself that I've simplified some of the details in here for the sake of this being a, a first time out. One of the ways I've simplified it is if you just focus on this top part um, up here, the, the local and the remote. <clears throat> I've simplified the local part of the way that Git works just for just for demonstration purposes, really. And um, the way that I've done that is I've presented the uh, working directory, the staging area, and the local repo all as a single entity. But technically, there are a few more details here where um, you, you may or may not, in, um, in some workflows, have your working directory be the same as a physical memory place where your local repository is. You may or may not. I, I always do because of the way that I work and use Git, but for bigger projects, for software development, you might not always. So um, in this um, scenario, there is another little concept I didn't tell you about yet. We can usually, in my workload, I, in my workflow, I generally don't, don't do an add step, but um, if you have a a more complicated workflow, you might have a working directory where you've made some changes and you you add the changes you've made, the diff that you've made to a staging area. And it's from that staging area that a commit is made. Um, and that goes into the local repository. And then it's from that local repo that the push is made. And likewise, 
um, when a pull is made, it's made from the remote down to the local repository. And if you're working on a big system where there are multiple people working on it, you may then want to check out some files that you're going to work on and edit um, from that local repo. So this is the full fat workflow. I've just simplified it partly based on um, the needs that I have and the way that I use GitHub and, and the way that I anticipate you, but also just because uh, most of us who do data analysis with Git and GitHub don't don't have to check out um, files we're working on in a local repo, not, not usually anyway. So this is a full fat version of the simplified version that I've talked about. And it's the simplified version, I think, that would apply to almost everything that most of us would do with Git and GitHub. <clears throat> now, what is GitHub? I've mentioned this a number of times. It's all it's almost difficult to um, to mention Git without mentioning GitHub these days. So um, so here's what I think GitHub is just in my own words is that it's a very easy to use cloud host for Git. Um, it's easy to use um, because it's it's web based with a graphical user interface. It's easy for beginners because of that, and it just lives in a website. But we'll look at the website in a second. We'll look at it together, and of course, it implements the vanilla version of Git, the most popular version of version control software out there. The the logo is um, a little cat, and there are many versions of this this little cat and the little cat um i think earlier versions this was the cat's tail but in later versions um this is a tentacle why is there a tentacle on this cat i don't know but uh, you can always tell that there's some version like this uh, associated with github this is one of the more modern low detail logos now github as a site has got some social media aspects to it, and I'll, I'll show you my GitHub site in a second. When I say social media, there's a certain connotation to it. Some of you may have be interested in that. Some of you may be repelled by, by that. I could say it, it's not at all like Twitter or um, TikTok or anything like that. There's nothing at all like that in terms of social media. But the way that it does have some social media um, aspects are that uh, if there is somebody who's a developer who creates tools you're interested in, or maybe they've created a single repo that you're interested in and that you work with, then um, you can you can follow that user. You can say, hey, I really like your work. I'm going to give you a star. Um, and you can be alerted to when the person who's made that repo you're interested in update it. So um, if you're if you're keenly interested in doing it, you can um, you can interact in, in that level for for repos that you're interested in or are useful to you. There is another aspect to the social media part. Um, I say social media it's not maybe not the quite right word for it, but um, there is a mechanism in Git and GitHub. That um, if someone releases some software. Or a, or a data workflow or a, a tool that you want to use for your research. And, and I mean, there are millions of kinds of tools and so many just regular scientists and students that are on GitHub these days that it's it's just amazing. I was just in someone's office earlier talking about um, using Raspberry Pis, these little microcomputers to record birdsong. And they were telling me, oh, I'm I'm watching this guy's YouTube and I downloaded his stuff from GitHub. And this is somebody who does absolutely no computer programming, one of my colleagues. One of the social media aspects that's important is that if you download code and you're working with it, maybe you'll find bugs or maybe there's some kind of functionality that, that in your work you add to it or improve the code. Well, one social media like aspect of GitHub is that um, there's a mechanism for you to say, hey, I've done something good, and you can offer your diff 
to the owner of a repo, and then they can decide whether they want to merge it with uh, with their with their main repository. So it is a way to actually collaborate with uh, people, sometimes people that aren't your your closest colleagues, um, but in, instead somebody you share a, a problem with and a, and a solution with that's relevant for your research. There are also some admin aspects to uh, GitHub, which make it very useful. One I've already mentioned is that um, I mentioned that you could make your code public, but you can also make it private. And if it's private, you can add collaborators. So for me, I was working with Megan, for example, on a website or on a data analysis or a, a data dashboard for the farm. That's that is that last one is what Megan has been doing a lot of work on recently. Um, we could, if we're so inclined, we could make the um, repository private and um, one of us could in, invite the other one to be um, collaborators. Uh, we may may or may not want to release it to the public. And it, it so happens that we we have released the dashboards to the public. Um, but that's the admin control that you have. And there are some other aspects of admin control, like um, you can uh, set up triggers that are that are code for some automation that happens, for example, like updating a data set. Uh, there are actually quite a lot of them. I'm not going to talk about very many of them. It's very popular. Um, in fact, it's had a meteoric rise over the past 10 years. Um, I think when I first encountered it, I, I didn't quite understand the idea of using a cloud-based Git system. But uh, over the years, I learned all sorts of things I could do with it. And it's become, like I mentioned, an essential part of what I do. But it's not just me. Um, it's become very popular with lots of applied scientists, uh, lots of statisticians, and of course, lots and lots and lots and lots of uh, people that would self-identify as computer programmers. It's very popular for applied scientists because one of the things I love so much about science and about biology and and ecology is that there's this great tradition of um, people finding a problem, encountering some problem in their research, creating their own solution for it, and then immediately sharing that solution with as many people as they can who would find it useful. And for some of the same reasons that software like R is popular, makes GitHub very popular. I mentioned the Raspberry Pi software for recording birdsong. Any problem that you can think of that has automation and some co code, including data analysis problems, there, there probably are many, many repos that are relevant on GitHub. Some are very popular. Some are, you know, famous on GitHub. I don't know how famous famous on GitHub is, but uh, some are famous on GitHub with lots of stars and lots of followers. Some are very modest. Some are very modest. Uh, like my GitHub account has almost no followers. I don't I'm, I don't use my GitHub account like that. I just use it mainly as backup and a collaboration tool. Um, it does require an account, but the accounts are free. Could I just take a, a micro survey real quick and ask uh, for everybody to say yes or no in chat? Do you have a, a GitHub account? Just say yes or no um, in chat, if you would. Let's take a little survey. Some yeses, some nos, a mix. There's more yeses than I thought there would be, potentially. Um, it's so easy to start an account if you use Google. If you have a, a non-university email, um, I would tend to recommend that you use a non-university email. The reason for that is that um, if you ever get a job somewhere else and you lose your Harper Adams email, you won't at the same time lose access to your GitHub repo. 
um, the accounts are free. You can pay for some services. For example, you can you can pay if you have the need to store very large data files. But that reminds me to say that the function of GitHub is actually not um, it's not to store large files. It's it's for storing lots of small files that are primarily computer code and, and little bits of data. And if you have large data files, I think the current um, I think the current limit for a single file is 100 megabytes. So if you have more, if you have a file that's more than 100 megabytes, the intention is that you store it somewhere else, like on a a Microsoft um, Cloud Drive or uh, or your Google Drive or somewhere like that. And down here, it's cut off on my slide, but uh, Microsoft bought GitHub a few years ago. And um, I think there was a time a decade or two ago where I wasn't a big Microsoft fan. I, I thought their software was bloated and slow, and I didn't even use Windows computers. And in fact, I wouldn't. I refused to on principle for a number of reasons. Um, but they really have turned their company around, and they've done a lot of uh, open source projects. And uh, this is one of their, their best projects, in my opinion. OK, so um, how can you use Git and GitHub? <clears throat> now, um, you have a, you're spoiled for choice, really, for GitHub. I, I should say before I get into um, this that there are actually quite a lot of alternatives to GitHub, and some of them are quite popular as well. Like one of them is um, called GitLab. Um, which is which is um, one of the popular ones. And I think there is actually an official Harper Adams GitLab. Um, uh, it's possible for you to use it if you want. But uh, GitHub is by far the most popular one. It's by far the most mainstream one as well, and it's owned by Microsoft. It has the most features as well. So I think GitLab um, was one that came up that added a few features uh, that GitHub didn't quite yet. GitHub tended to be a little more, more conservative with uh, some of the features, but there, there are other alternatives. So uh, when I say what I'm about to say, you know, keep that in mind that you are spoiled for choice, which can be overwhelming when you're starting to use it. So let me tell you a little bit about just the basic options for using Git and GitHub. Um, now, the way that I tend to use GitHub is with a piece of software called uh, GitHub Desktop. Now, why have I clicked on that and made that happen? Oh, goodness. There we go. <clears throat> I've tended to use a piece of software called GitHub Desktop. I'll show it to you in a second, and I'll even show you how it works um, before we end the session. But uh, essentially, it's, um, it's a little bit of a um, graphical user interface that allows you to use Git and GitHub without doing any coding whatsoever. You may have done some coding for your analysis or whatever it is, but you can use Git and GitHub without any coding. On the other end of the spectrum, um, you can use the GitHub command line. In Windows, um, this requires a special piece of software. So um, you have to download the Git software. You would have to download the GitHub desktop software. But uh, even if you download the Git, software you'd have to download the github command line software to run it on windows typically when you install this stuff i think the github command line is bundled with um with github desktop git may also be bundled with it too the command line requires that you um you memorize some computer commands and you just enter them usually sitting in your um your folder so th this is one that I just downloaded. I don't tend to use GitHub from the, the command line, standalone command line uh, at all. But um, here what you can see is that um, this person has issued a command called git status. And uh, they've got a status of two files. And then they've uh, identified the, what that status is. So there's one new file called license.mdmarkdown file. 
and one says there's um, a modified file, so readme.md. And uh, then there's a command down here to commit, git commit. Um, and then there's a comment. So whenever you commit, as I'll show you in a second, um, it's customary. In fact, it's required that you um, document a um, an explanation of the of the um, of that stopping point. Now these days, um, you can also use Git built into R Studio or uh, VS Code or the others. Um, I do use the built-in uh, Git functionality in VS Code. This is a piece of software you may not have used, but it's for doing coding stuff. You can use R in VS Code, but I just find the way that they've integrated Git very, very powerful. And uh, you can also use it in R Studio. I have used it a few times, but I just didn't find it as easy to use. So this is essentially how you use it. Got a few demos. I'm going to just um, <clears throat> remove this real quick. The first thing I'll show you is um, my GitHub desktop, and I'll also open up a, a folder here. Now this is my um, this is a folder that's in um, a Git space called uh, Git Harper Data Science, and um, inside, if I just click up to that, you can see that there are a few folders and just some random files floating around. But this website um, folder is a is itself a GitHub repo. Um, maybe I'll try to uh, make this a little bit better for you to see by doing this. There we go. Hopefully that's a little bit better for you to see. Can you see my cursor floating around in my um, folder when I window it like that? Can somebody just say yes and or no? <laughs> yeah, you can. Okay, good. Uh, you can see that this is a GitHub repo because um, it's got some hidden files, some hidden folders. Um, when they're in the Windows system, if you put a dot with no letters, no characters before the dot, um, it would be referred to as a hidden file. I've, I have my settings so that I can see hidden files on my system. But uh, we can see it's got a Git folder. If we just look inside the Git folder, we see quite a lot of stuff. Um, and this stuff is what keeps track of the diffs uh, in the whole folder. Um, I've got a Quarto hidden file because the the function of this folder is to make a website using Quarto. Uh, so Quarto has a lot of other stuff in it, um, which I won't go through. And I've also got a hidden rproj.user file. And this is because it's also an R project. So this, this GitHub repository is itself an R project that uses Quarto. So there, there are a lot of settings and you can save um, the working directory and such as that uh, in there. All those are automatic. I would never even go in there and look at those um, ever. I don't know if you noticed, but my Dropbox just updated with that Git. And um, I don't know why it did that, but I'm just going to go down on my computer. I'm going to stop sharing and share my whole window again so you can see everything. There you go. And I'm going to um, just pause my Dropbox. I'm going to pause it. I accidentally clicked indefinitely. I'm going to resume sync. Then I'm going to pause it for 30 minutes. There we go. Now, um, I've got my GitHub desktop. You can see I've got a lot of repositories that I sometimes work with. As you can see my current repository is the folder called website. If we look inside my um, my list of repos, you see I have a lot of them named website. 
<laughs> maybe we'll talk about when we talk about how to make a website i'll show you the system that i use to make free websites on um, github but if we go down to um, um, harper data science it's this website repo that we're in <clears throat> and uh, what shows up in this changes tab are changes that I've made and we can just see that there's um, a change to the rproj.user file and I could tell maybe I should tell um, git to ignore that file but I haven't done that and it's detected Hello. Maybe I should tell um, R to ignore that, but I haven't. So it's detected some change in the status of my of uh, my R, and I think I have R Studio. I have it closed now, but I think I had it open just before this this meeting, so it remembered some little change. And I also have one called Git um, dot pptx, a Git PowerPoint that's in the Pages folder. So uh, this is a uh, PowerPoint that I made to make some of the graphics for the for the slides that I made and I just put together those graphics and then save them as pictures so git has noticed that I saved that in there what I'm going to do is I'm going to update a summary of this I'm just going to put a terrible message um, and just put the word update and then I'm going to commit my changes it says commit to main because um, another little detail I, I didn't elaborate on is that you can have different versions of your repository. You can have a main version, and you can have as many other branches, so-called branches, as you want. But you would usually just work with main. So now that I've committed, it's inviting me to um, push to the origin, which is up in the cloud on GitHub. And um, if I just demonstrate, I bring up. Um, a web page, go to my GitHub repo. In fact, um, I go here and right click. I can uh, view on GitHub and it'll open the page for me. What I'm going to be looking at here is my pages folder. This is up in the cloud on, on GitHub. You can see in this folder, I don't have that PowerPoint file. But once I commit and push to origin. Um, now the diff is empty. Now the changes that have staged, committed, and pushed um, have been committed and pushed to the remote. Now, because that's a PowerPoint, it might take a second, but I'm just going to hard refresh, three, two, one, and it, it pops up there. Um, uh, th this is a repo that um, you know you can check this out yourself if you're interested. There's nothing there much to see, but uh, in case you were, in case you wanted to directly download any of the stuff, um, you know you could. You could go to that link, come to this page, you could click on that PowerPoint, and you could click the download button to download the raw file. And sure enough, it would download, and we could open it and see it. So that's just how that works. Um, by the way, if we just go up to the main part of this um, repo, to the front part of it, th this is all of the code that makes this website, our main website, and has all of the, has one folder for all of these sessions. <clears throat> I just have a link to the YouTube for most of them, and but all of them have slides and other assets. So uh, if you're interested in, this is a relatively complex one compared to some that can be made, maybe compared to ones that we would make, but you can see exactly how it's made. That's the idea. No problem, see you, Ann. Now it's five o'clock, it's straight up five o'clock. <clears throat> That's just a taste of um, what we could do. But if, if people want to stick around for five more minutes, I'll, I'll give you an example of a clone and I'll show you how you could use a clone in in your um, things. So if you need to go, no problem. Thanks for coming, and I'll see you next time. But if you want to stick around for five minutes, 
I'll just go through a clone. So if I open up my Git folder, go to uh, my Dropbox, what I want to do is I want to look for um, a recent project that I've done. It's a GitHub repo. And I'm going to open up um, this repo called BirdNet Test. And then I'm going to go to my own <clears throat> repositories site. And, you know, if you want to, you can, you could come here and browse around yourself. It says I've got 34 repositories. Most of these are open, um, public, public, public. You know, you won't be able to see the private ones. I've got one private one there and a, a few other, few other ones. <clears throat> But um, if we open up this BirdNet test, what we'll see is um, just a few files, a few folders, and we'll see a little README. Now, without even doing anything, I um, every GitHub repository by default has a, a README, just a text document that creates an HTML version that tells what it's about. It says this is a small repository. Um, containing code to identify bird species from audio recordings using a, an, a foundation model, an AI called BirdNet Analyzer. Some test data sets are provided. And I embedded a, a link for this repo to use um, Google Colab. What this does, if we do it, is it opens up the code document in Google Colaboratory. To be able to do this now, you need a, a Colab account. There we go. And it gives me the option of clicking on that IPython notebook. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger for you to see a little bit better. And I'm going to open this up. So um, you can basically see that um, in this IPython notebook, I've got some instructions about how to use this little test. and the very first command that I've embedded in it is uh, git clone that repository. And uh, if I just open up the folders here, I'm going to connect to a runtime. And it gives me a, a default folder with sample data. But let me clone this, 3, 2, 1. I'm going to run it anyway. I totally trust the author of this one. It's going to take just a second to download. Now, it's not downloading it to my computer. It's downloading it from GitHub to Google Colab server that I've just connected to. So Google Colab, if you don't know about this, is a free virtual platform for researchers and other people to use <clears throat> that um, lets you use a so-called virtual machine, a little slice of cloud computing space that has its own RAM, has its own um, central processing unit. And for AI stuff, it also lets you have a free gra graphics processing unit, a GPU, in case you need it. Now, um, this has updated everything, and it's downloaded everything to a folder over here called BirdNet Test. You can see it there, and I'll just look in it. And this has nothing in it except my... Um, my uh, my GitHub repo, it's just downloaded everything. And I only have the code that's in this file, and I have a data file. The data file has a few um, example bits of code here. Now, I've, I've been working on this last few days. I'm going to change my directory to go into this, this BirdNet test folder, 321. I'm going to install some, some stuff. <clears throat> These are requirements that I need. It's is equivalent to downloading R libraries. This is in Python. Now, a thing that I want you to notice here is that um, pretend that I'm not who I am. Pretend I'm not Ed. Pretend this repository I wrote is not my repository. Pretend it belongs to somebody else, and I'm just interested in it. I want to try it out. So far, the only thing I've done is I've clicked that open and collab button on their GitHub repo. 
have opened this up and have just run the first couple of lines. I didn't have to write even. No problem. See you, Kenny, Katrina. Um, and it's downloaded everything and just set it all up. I haven't had to write any code whatsoever. So, um, so I've done that. And then I'm going to load my libraries. This is the way we do it in Python, three, two, one. And then uh, now I had this set up for a single recording and I have my, um, now my data uh, in here. Let's see, data, ed, so I, I see I haven't really um, updated my my folders very much. Let's see what I've got in here. So I've got it in this one. So I think this is the one that I want to run there. But I've changed the folders a little bit. So I'm in um, BirdNet test. So I need to tell it I'm in data and then in EdH 2024-0420. You can see the sparks flying. It's a little game, the combos game in Colab that um, you get a lot of sparks if you keep your typing constant. It's just a little game for productivity. Head H 20.24. So when I run this, what it's going to do, I've already loaded up the test. It's going to analyze the data. It's going to load up a little bit of a bird recording I made at my house that it just had a few species of birds in it. And then it's going to analyze that with the AI. Three, two, one. See how long that takes. It's loaded. This is just a one minute recording. It's very fast. If any of you are interested in birds, this is the same AI that um, is recorded. So what it said is that at, at my longitude and latitude near Market Drayton here, and at the date that I gave it, April 20th, um, it, it said that there were 145 potential species um, that were done. So um, what this does is it just arranges the data and shows the counts for the detections. Three, two, one. Oops, and what is it not like? <clears throat> I think um, in the interest of time, if you want to stick with me, I will try to fix this error. Species count, Python, let's see what I've done. There's a P, common name, common name. It's on line six. Common name, entry, common name. I think I've changed the name of um, my data object. Recording analyze. EF equals PD. PDF. Well, that should have worked. All right, one more time. Still getting an error. Because I haven't run it, I didn't really prepare to, to run it this. And because we're 10 minutes after, I'm just going to stop it there. I really just wanted to show you um, the functionality of git and git clone. And now we're up to a point in this repo where you would have to do some coding to fix it. And I think I'm going to save this fix possibly for next week when I demo what I'm actually trying to do with this project. So on, on that bombshell, as they say, um, I, I'll call the meeting adjourned. <laughs> Any comments or questions? I'm going to stop sharing.